All right, welcome back to another Covenant 25 Monster Train Guide. This time we're going to be going over the mid-game. Mid-game defined as rings four through six, rings slash circles, whatever you prefer to call them. And I will say that some of the uh, parts of this guide kind of assume that you've watched the first early game video. Uh, I didn't really want to be redundant with a few things such as like uh, you know, I'm not going to go over which cards typically help with like boss killing and whatnot. Um, and also, uh, I'm not going to go over like what cards you need to look out for for a particular Seraph. So at a few times, I'm going to say things like, you know, here you need to look out for uh, adding Seraph answers to your deck. But I have separate guides for those, so I don't really want to be too redundant here. So, you know, check them out. I'll link them below. Uh, I'll also be a link in the chapter times below, as always. Um, so. Without any further ado, let's get into it here. All right. So as I mentioned, rings slash circles four through six is what I'm going to say mid game is. So basically the fights after Daedalus slash Talos um, all the way up to and including Fell slash Arcus. Um, so before, you know, the deck might be a little more hacky to get through those first three rings, but by this point, you kind of need to start forming a theme. You know, you need a specific game plan, whereas before you could just kind of slap together a makeshift tank, uh, throw a few buffs on him, throw a few debuffs on the enemy, and you'll get by. Uh, you're not really going to have that luxury, especially by like rings five and six. The ring four boss isn't so hard, but ring five boss is definitely a little bit tough. Um, and uh, yeah, this is kind of the point of the game where a lot of endgame decisions are going to be made. Um, you know, getting specific answers for Seraph uh, and just your general theme, like, are you going to be an incan deck? Are you going to be a regen focused deck? Uh, do you need to rely on spikes? Things like this. Um, they really need to start being solidified here. Uh, you know, are you a reform deck? Et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, I, on that same note from before about the Ring 5 bosses, um, the Ring 5 bosses, uh, really here, I should just call out Ring 5 here, but there's a lot of gotchas there. Everyone's pretty familiar with the stealth boss. I see that one kind of complained about a lot. That one can definitely get you. Uh, but honestly, the other two can too. Like, they got the sweeper boss on that ring, and they got that five multi-striking boss on that ring, which does... 25 damage. You're not really going to find any other boss doing that much. That's literally as much damage as Arcus does, so uh, definitely some gotchas there. So first, let's uh, go over Ring 4. Um, you know, you're going to get your first upgrades offered, offered here, both the Champ and the Pyre upgrade. Um, can't really comment too much on Champ upgrades. That's just going to be, you know, whatever you're particularly going for there. But as far as Pyre upgrades go, I have a general rule that I say when you're kind of unsure or in doubt, uh, draw is generally the safest to take. Uh, draw is always going to be useful. There's not a whole lot, other than Awoken, there's really not a whole lot of cards that like provide card draw in this game. So you kind of get a pretty unique upgrade when you do that um, draw upgrade. And uh, it's always just going to be beneficial to be able to dig through your deck faster and find like your key cards. Um, and also just having a bigger hand each turn uh, gives you more choices on what to play. That's generally going to be more useful. Now I'm not trying to say draw is just objectively always better than the others. Like definitely don't, you know, misconstrue, misconstrue what I'm saying there. But if you, you know, if you have a real good reason to, to take Pip or Ember, you're obviously going to take that. But if it's a little unsure, I would say generally lean toward draw because it's it's the easiest. It's the safest, I should say. Now, uh, also on that note, though, if you do end up taking Ember or Pip, you know, if you don't take the draw upgrade, um, you might be more enticed to take the path. Usually there's a path that offers, you know, purging cards um, or at the very least a shop where you can purge cards. If you don't take that draw upgrade, you might be enticed to to go that path right off the bat there in ring four um, because since you're not getting that extra consistency that you would have got with a draw upgrade you can kind of counteract that by taking out some stewards or taking out uh, some other card like a plink or something that's really not useful to you at this point in the game um 
and uh, yeah, definitely start looking for the Seraph answers at this point. I'll, I'll probably be reiterating that a lot, but like, uh, you can get through these rings just fine without doing the Seraph answers, but that's like the classic way to like just be bewildered once you get to Seraph. Like, he stomped the whole run and then you just die uh, because he had no answers. And from ring four on is really when you need to start prioritizing those things because if you if you followed my early game guide you should be pretty set up to in terms of like having a good tank and what by now what not by now and some boss killing cards so you really just don't need to be looking too much for those type of cards now at this point and really you just need to be looking for seraph answers and just thematic like choices to like help your decks theme so let's go through each of the ring four mobs here um clipped tormentors uh this in my opinion is kind of one of the easier ones if not the easiest uh first wave is going to be pretty much zero threat at all uh as long as you have any aoe or backline clear you can kill that guy out uh, even if not it's not like he actually represents any higher damage or damage to your waves it will be annoying that he hurts your draw and you have to like spend energy to uh, take out those scourge cards but you know this might clip tormentors might be one of these fights where you're kind of enticed to set up at the bottom floor instead of the top floor especially if you have like sweepers and whatnot uh, just because really the only way you can even get punished in this fight is if those scourge cards get out of control even then though there's not like the wave two doesn't even have any so it's like really only this wave three to wave four is particularly punishing uh it's like even if you let all these guys go by that's not even that much scourge cards coming in um and then everything else is you know kind of standard these these clipped uh whatever you call them clip guardians or whatever um i don't think i don't know what they're called clip something but they're kind of annoying right six damage and 105 health this is also, uh, I'll be getting to this point later, but by this point, the tanks significantly get tougher, um, especially by ring five. Uh, we'll get onto all that later, but like starting to get tank killing option uh, answers is pretty important starting now too. Uh, as far as the boss round goes, that can be a little annoying because then there is two of these in the back and say that you did set up at the top or whatnot. That'll really hurt your ability to really... Uh, spend much on like scaling up um so you know this clip tormentors fight uh again might you might be uh served well by just setting up the bottom um but you know if you have any sort of aoe like maybe you have like a vent or a glimmer um or a sweeper or whatnot any of those is really just gonna clean these up pretty easy no problem now as far as these bosses go I think they're all pretty easy. Like if you compare them to the boss you just beat, like Daedalus or Talos, Talos or whatnot, they almost don't even have better stats. The stats are almost just like in line. I mean, yeah, they do a little bit more damage, but they have less health. This one has more health. Um, but you know, he again, if you set up at the bottom, this uh, dude that gains like five attack each floor really isn't going to do much to you. I mean, seven damage, it's pretty much nothing. Uh, the extra 40 health is certainly not going to be that much of a factor, probably, compared to Daedalus and whatnot. Um, in either way, let's say you do set up at the top. Yeah, he'll gain, he'll be up to 17 damage by that time. Still not the end of the world, in my opinion. Like, um, I've never been that punished by just setting at the top against this boss, but it is worth noting that if you if you do see this boss, especially combined with this group, you should really just think about setting up at the bottom. As far as trials go, I didn't mark any of them as tough, just because there's really not much punishment from taking any of the trials here. Uh, you know, there's a lot that are, that are kind of middle of the road. Like if, you, if they if you get the plus fifteen armor one, it will be harder to clear out the back line. But then again, clear, not being able to clear out the back line isn't like the end of the world because there's just not much incoming damage. Um, you know, really, it's like as long as you can kill these three tanks here, that's really the only significant pyre damage that's coming in. And of course, the boss. Uh, as far as easy goes, Mark of Invasion is really going to. Almost all of these fights are going to be easy for Mark of Invasion. Only one of them's not, and we'll get to that in a bit here. 
This mark of invasion is even easier than the first rings. It basically represents a lot. As long as you're not, if, as long as you don't do something stupid and, and like kill a few of them and leave a few of them, like literally, you can just let them walk on by, and they'll only do two damage each, and the pyre will just shoot them all in one go. So you can literally just let them walk on by the pyre and not really care. Uh, and retribution, similarly, it's like there's just really not much punish punishment here for giving them spikes like it might represent some extra damage to your pyre but compared to like every other trial it's really just representing like an additional four to your units and pyre um it's really not that bad uh, and that's clipped tormentors i think they're pretty easy clipped infiltration also i don't think is particularly hard uh you know if you compare it to the last group instead of um the scourge problem the only problem you have is just that as yes, if you can't kill the back line which at one health it shouldn't <laughs> like if at this point in the game you can't take care of a one health backliner you might have some issues that uh go beyond this sort of easy troop here but anyway um yeah if you don't kill them the only punishment really is that you just get a turn less to scale obviously if you see clipped infiltration you shouldn't put any of your high value units on the middle floor um you want to set up at the bottom or top probably the top i mean even and another thing to think about here this boss here the one that gains five per floor sort of climbed it's actually beneficial for you just to leave this guy alive if you set up at the top here because then he'll only gain five instead of the the ten that he would have gained without this dude you know so he actually helps you in this fight um yeah so i mean even the the boss i would say is just significantly easier than the last one because uh you don't even have to kill this guy and it almost helps you to keep him around um, and other than that, it's not too many differences, you know, round wave one is almost the same, except there's a little bit more incoming damage with this dude instead of a, a scourge shuffler. Uh, there's a random healer at one point, um, not much else. So, you know, you still got this tank, uh, on three waves to deal with, which is annoying, you know, comparing it to the last, it's like, you don't see a whole lot change here. Right. Uh, as far as the trials go. This is the one I'm talking about, the only one that can potentially have a tough mark of invasion. Granted, if you have a consistent AoE, uh, it's or just a consistent way to kill the haste unit, it's not tough. But I have had random runs where this actually completely wrecked me taking this mark of invasion. So the reason for that is, let's say you can't clear out the middle floor that these dudes come in on, and you can't clear out the bottom floor. They all come up to the top. And then you got four of those sycophant guys, because these are the guys that basically extinguish and add two damage to the entire floor. So that's two times four, eight damage. So you're not adding eight damage to this frontline tank along with the backliner. Um, granted, the back, well, not really the backliner, but uh, basically to this tank, he now just gets eight damage. And uh, that ends up being like, uh, you know, kind of a good amount to your pyre. Still not the end of the world. But it is something to think about here when taking Mark of Invasion. If you if you think you might get screwed by that, it's worth maybe not taking Mark. It's the only one where I wouldn't take Mark in this ring. Uh, I would pretty much auto take Mark in all other cases, unless you're on like two pyre health or something. Um, then as far as the easy ones go, I listed Spell Shield here is pretty easy because it's like, like in the other one, you know, the one before, it's like you could get punished by not being able to kill your, these backliners out because then you'll get a lot of uh, uh, scourge shufflers in. But here it's like the only punishment is like it just jumps up a wave and that's not enough punishment for this to really be that bad of a, you know, if you, if you can't kill people with uh, spell damage. And then in a similar vein, Retribution, there's really just no issue with uh, spikes here and everything else is kind of the middle of the road. Um, yep, yeah, that's that one. Now we get to protectors of the clip. This one's, in my opinion, a little bit harder than the other ones. Um, right from the first round, you kind of have more damage represented. So if you compare to the other ones, they have this dude that has less um, health, like, you know, it's 60 versus 90. Doesn't do any damage. This one does do damage, and it encants an additional 10 armor every single encant with a damage dealer behind it. So that's just object, like we can probably agree that it's at least if we're looking at wave one, it's just objectively harder than the other two. 
Wave 2 looks pretty similar. Wave 3 looks like, I think, identical. You know, largely identical. You know, you could almost say harder. I mean, I would say harder. You have to get through 60 health before getting to this guy. That can represent a lot of power damage. Um, and then wave 4, I would say harder. I mean, it's got a lot of damage behind. And then that tank that can just has more health, gains more health, deals damage. Uh, so I think it's just kind of objectively harder than the other two. And also, if, as far as the boss goes, if you know if you've got any any AOE, it's not a problem. But neither are these. If you don't have AOE, I would say these are more punishing because that's 18 damage per hit. You know, that's over double the damage even a top floor um, this guy will do. Right. So even the boss round is just kind of objectively harder, I would say. Um, as far as the trials go, Mark of Invasion is pretty easy as always. Uh, Retribution again, not much of a punish. Uh, tough. I should have listed uh, Heaven Seal here as well, probably. But um, you know, Armor Emblem, Heaven Seal, Armor Emblems might be even a little bit tougher just because this there's so much uh, backline damage here coming in. You know, you got it here, you got it here, two here, and then two on the boss. Uh, 15 armor is no joke to add to that. I mean, even an upgraded glimmer or vent is not taking that out, right? You need like extra help on top of that. So armor emblem actually ends up being pretty tough here. And it's and you know these um, and it just gives these guys even more health. That's a lot of that's a lot of health to chunk through. And in the same vein, you know the aggressive amulet. This really comes down to like your how consistent your AOE is. If you don't have consistent AOE, aggressive amulet and also the multi strike one. Those are going to wreck you. Um, you know, this is this goes from 18 to, you know, add like 12. So now it's like 30 damage coming in in the back. Um, pretty tough to deal with. Same here. Like there's 30 damage coming. Well, in here it would be uh, 12. Yeah, yeah, like 30 damage. Um, yeah. So protectors of the clip, be prepared for pain with this one. And clipped guard has you know i think for sure in a general sense both protectors of the clipped and clipped guard have my vote for being harder than the other two clip guard what i would say about it is it is on average easier than protectors of the clip but in the cases where you just can't deal with this group well it absolutely ravages you um you know compared to a lot of the other ones you, you got a lot of uh you got a lot of health to chunk through on each of these. Um, now, I'd, uh, they're basically, they gain uh, three attack per climb. There are some ways to mitigate that. Like, you can purposely, like, if you know you can't um, kill all of them, you could always, like, ascend them uh, just to make the impact to your pyre less. Uh, granted, on these rounds, you'd probably be better served like ascending the f these frontline units to just get them out of the way so you can actually damage these dudes. Um, but you know, m even more so than just the the standard fight being hard, uh, the trials particularly end up making these uh, that much harder. A lot of the trials, I should say. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second here, but. You know, just so really quick, almost every wave is essentially the same thing. You know, you got the two dudes that are relatively tanky at 35 health, but not that tanky. Uh, but, you know, AoE isn't going to take them out, right? Like, that AoE will maybe save you a pyre hit here and there, but you do need, like, kind of double tank killing answers, uh, especially once these shield dudes get in front to be able to take them out. Random thing I also thought was funny, like, so this healer is the healer from the f the early game. I don't know why it randomly is here instead of like the other standard healer. I don't know if there's like a lore reason for that, but I thought that was kind of funny. But that is how it is. Like for some reason, this healer is present in this fight. I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah, basically you need you need tank killing things or positional manipulation things. Uh, you need either maybe some fast scaling. As far as where to set up. Uh, if your tanking is good enough, you could still just set up at the top. Um, you know, just give your. It, it might be more beneficial just to give your damage time to scale, so you can actually kill these things. But I find myself often just setting up at the bottom in this fight. Um, this is a fight where you uh, you're you're glad if you have like a icy sylphite or like a sweeping tethys. That's pretty good in this fight. 
or even like frostbite, just things that will continue to do damage uh, after you apply them all. Um, as far as the boss goes, it's a little bit different than the other ones. So in all the other ones, the dudes come in behind, squishy dudes in this one, they get a tank in front. I would say in a general sense that makes it harder. That essentially all that does is just add health to these bosses. But luckily all of these bosses, in my opinion, just aren't very hard. So it ends up not really being too much of an issue. As far as the trials go, uh, Mark is easy, Retribution is easy. Same reasons as kind of before. Um, but pretty much everything else I listed is tough. Like if these guys just get six extra damage right from the get go and it kind of grows to 12, that's, you know, on some of the, you know, especially like wave three and four, if it's not out of the question that you don't do a bit of damage to them before they get to the pyre. That can represent, you know, two hits of 12, uh, what is it? Two plus six is eight, eight plus six, like 14 damage, two hits of 14 damage to your pyre. That's a lot of pyre damage. And even, and seal of aggression is pretty much the same story, except even worse, seal of aggression is a multi-strike. So they would be doing, you know, eight or whatever damage. So 16 each, uh, each round, it's a lot of damage and armor emblem in the other sense, um, just gives them a good amount of extra health and it becomes, especially on these wave in three and four, you know, that's an extra, you know, you times it by three. So 15 times three, that's 45 extra HP. You have to chunk through to be able to deal with these floors. Um, that's no joke. And these dudes do do a lot of higher damage by the time they get to the top. Cause remember, it's like they gain three each floor that also counts from floor three up to the pyre. Right. So like, uh, you know, they'll have five on the middle, they'll have, uh, eight, on the top and then they're up to 11 by the time they get to the the top so and i i kind of did my math wrong there before so that would be 11 times 2 in the case of multi-strike or you know 11 plus 6 which so it would be um 17 each round so both of those can be brutal but then even just having them at 11 uh and full health or even more than four health, full health can be brutal in the same vein heaven seal like it's rare for me to just take these guys all out in one go. Usually I need to like apply some damage and then like finish up with spells or finish up with like a multi-floor setup. In all those cases, Heaven Seal is going to be brutal against you. Mainly, you know, just because the main units, obviously the armor dude uh, doesn't really have much, um, doesn't gain much from Heaven Seal, but these dudes will. You know, if you're trying to like hit them twice, maybe maybe your goal is just to hit them with like a sweeper and then finish with like an AOE. Not gonna happen with Heaven Seal, right? So really this this does end up being pretty tough to particularly to take trials on. If you don't take a trial or you got or you lucked out on an easier trial, it's not so hard, right? But um the ceiling of pain for this one is pretty high, let's put it that way. And that's ring four. So once you do that, uh, then you're on to ring five. Ring five, as I've mentioned before, has some pretty tough bosses. Um, you know, as far as like, you know, you have your three main bosses like Daedalus, Talos, and then Arcus, Fel, and the Seraph. Uh, as far, if, if we call all the other bosses like the lesser bosses or whatever, I would say ring five by far has the hardest ones. Uh, I don't really find many of the other rings have that hard of bosses, uh, but this one particularly, uh, can definitely catch you by surprise all and, and all of them can in their own way We'll get to all that later though um, And I will say, you know, if you followed my early game guide it is meant to Set you up with tanks that can get that should be able to survive against ring five So definitely if you haven't checked that out check out the boss killing section to check out the tank section if you follow that through the early game, you shouldn't have to find many additional answers by the time this comes around. So just something to mention there. Um, but yeah, defense will go a long way. You know, if you find some more Merchant of Steels along the way, it's time to try to get some extra health, some Endless, some Armor Incant. Any of those type of uh, unit upgrades is going to go a long way. Or if you find like defensive spells, like, you know, uh, you can still upgrade them a bit you know if you had wildwood saps from before 
maybe you maybe you just double stack them or or hell vent them you know whatnot like like it's it, uh you you might need some extra some extra answers there you're gonna have to gauge it really i uh, honestly i would just assume that you're gonna face the stealth boss if you assume that you're gonna be good against all of the bosses just assume that stealth boss is coming up and you'll be set for pretty much all the fights that you could encounter on this ring um and then also really annoying tanks exist in this ring this is where you start to see you know everyone's favorite unit overcharged tank aka balanced tank aka uh, motherfucker uh and other ones that kind of fall by the wayside like master of light i actually find can be pretty damn annoying too um so hopefully you have some tank killing uh cards by now because we haven't you know early game the tanks aren't so bad and you weren't really hunting that hard for tank killers you're more hunting for those the good tanks on your own side and hunting for good scaling and, and just buffs and debuffs stuff like that but at this point you really need to start getting some tank killing options so a lot of cards here i probably even missed a few but these are all the ones that come to my mind as things that can really go a long way to help you with tank killing so first thing ancient synergy pretty much unbeatable in the regard of tank killing you're looking at usually over 100 damage with this thing um just slap a few energy upgrades on it is my advice and then it becomes very playable you know at two or one energy the amount of damage this provides is amazing and it'll just delete any tank from the game especially in this mid game uh titan's gratitude as long as you can get uh plus damage on it don't be afraid to throw surge stone on it um you know the, the way monster train is there's not many fights that really have you cycling back through your deck a whole lot and surge stone and is, is is pretty much a-ok -okay to put on a any of these type of damage spells especially if they're like attuned the only reason i would ever not you know hesitate on a surge stone is if it's something i wanted to put hold over on so like like a glimmer uh i would want hold over on in a lot of cases especially if i'm facing like seraph the temperament and whatnot uh otherwise though just you know most of these damage spells um you can afford just to put a surge stone and honestly in a lot of cases the extra damage surge stone provides makes it better than just putting the normal plus 10 damage on it either way though plus 10 or the plus 20 damage surge stone either those are going to be great on cards like titan's gratitude crypt builder and even helical crystallis you know um helical crystallis is similar to attuned it doesn't get three times the damage but it gets two times the damage and also has a luxury of you know if you do kill that first tank uh, that's pretty common if they have like spell weakness applied then it can uh, shoot on through to the next one so you know all of those are going to be great tank killers ice and pyre is good if you're if you're consistently setting up at the top otherwise i wouldn't take this card it's really you know um it's definitely much better served if you have like an incant setup and you're just uh up at the top and you need some good uh front load of damage otherwise it's like there's just other cards that do what it does better like uh like i would just hope that i would add a siren song instead if i want like a pyrebound card to like kind of get me out of an issue there uh but you know ice and pyre can definitely be great for what it does crushing demise is very good you know um if you have any amount of aoe you can clear out all the little units and then usually there's just one or two tanks left over either either hitting on either one of them is going to be great um and even in the case where you can't kill out all the aoe you can just play it and there's a decent chance you just still kill the tank anyway right and if you don't you don't um you're still going to kill a unit it's still going to be a valuable card blade um and you know a lot of melting remnant strategies like to have their own unit killed too so crushing demise is just a really good card in general it's, it's i i'm generally looking for crushing demise if i'm melting remnant bramble lash is super situational um i would basically say the only reason i would take it is if i had uh the thorn hollow the thorned or the spike version of uh sentient in some cases if i was the wrathful spikes version of hellhorn prince but less so in that i find it almost just isn't needed in that version because he does so much damage anyway 
But especially those first two options, uh, Bramble Lash is very good. It'll just, similar to Ancient Synergy, just delete unit, the frontline unit from the game. Uh, but you know, if you don't have those um, spikes, like if, if your only spike applicator is like sharpen and it's just kind of there, like it's not part of your main game plan, I would say steer clear of Bramble Lash. It's probably not worth putting in your deck. Um, Inferno is very good, you know, 100. All right, my uh, computer decided to die on me. So I think I was starting to uh, talk about Inferno. So we'll just start from there. Um, Inferno, it is a very good card if you weren't aware of that. Um, at this point in the mid game, it'll literally just clear out the entire floor. I think the only thing other than a boss that even can survive it would be the clipped uh, spear dudes, and they'll be left over with like five health. Pretty sure they're just gonna die most likely. Like you've probably done five health either now or later um, from the point you play Inferno. So essentially it's just deleting an entire floor. Now obviously you don't play it on your floor with your main units, um, and if you can, try to get that ember reduction, because at three ember it's a little bit awkward to play. But you know, if you can get that down to two or one ember, that's a lot of damage. Um, and uh, you could also just like permafrost it. Uh, that's also another great option for it, then you just kind of play it when you need it. But yeah, even, you know, the great thing about Inferno is those floors that kind of have the double tanks, it even just cleans them up A-OK. -okay. Um, Furnace Tap and One Horn Tome, kind of same story between the two of them. It's just like kind of putting your scaling on steroids for your backliners or your damage dealer. Sometimes your frontliners are damage dealer, you know. Whoever's dealing your attack damage, you know, stick a Furnace Tap, stick a One Horn Tome on them. Probably not going to stick a One Horn Tome on a frontliner, but you know. Uh, either way, once you do that, any other sort of scaling, razor sharp edge, void binding, any sort of damage scaling you put on it uh, is just that much more kind of accelerated. Um, you know, and it's so basically, you know, you stick a multi strike on top of a unit that might already have like another multi strike upgrade. Um, either way, that's just going to make it so you scale so fast that eventually you're just clearing out the ways without even actually having to play any spells. And honestly, in the case of Umbra, considering Forever Consumed is really their only card that even does like frontline tank damage, uh, really just scaling your units is often your only option unless your secondary clan is something like Stygian or, or Hellhorn that can uh, directly deal with them with spells and stuff. Um, impressive and Impolite, similar story between those two, it's essentially just do you have imps? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, if you have imps, they're going to work. If they don't, they're not going to work. I would go so far as to say I, uh, you know, exiled version of Hellhorn, you're probably going to love them. Otherwise, I doubt you're going to have enough imps for them to really be worth it. Uh, Battering Ram, another situational card, as a lot of Hellhorn ones often are. If you got a lot of armor, um, it's going to be great. If you don't, it's going to be horrible. Uh, Forever Consumed, I don't think this is a very good card, but that being said, it is the only Umbra option for dealing like spell damage to the front line. It's become a little less shitty now that you can uh, put Ember upgrades on X cost cards. In that case, you can stick uh, basically every Ember uh, upgrade you put on it is like a 30 plus 30 damage upgrade to it. Um, and it also kind of allows you to play it at zero Ember, which can be good, especially if you're doing like Ember drain builds or whatnot. Uh, so it's less shitty now, so it's definitely an, a viable tank killer, especially for like mid game. I think it still suffers a lot toward come end game, but you know we're mainly focused on, on the mid game at this point. And in a similar story, Entombed Explosive is still really good at killing tanks uh, at this point in the game. Uh, it'll chunk through about half of a mid game's tank's health, um, maybe more depending on which tank it is, but. Uh, yeah, it's uh, not like amazing, but um, it's pretty just kind of versatile. It uh, it helps with killing tanks while also uh, going a long way toward any of your own like harvest synergies or if you have like artifact support. You know, there's one artifact that doubles your extinguish effect. In that case, it's doing 100 damage. So that's definitely killing tanks even into the end game at that point. Um, 
but yeah, Entombed Explosive, pretty good option, uh, especially considering uh, the um, Melting Remnant don't necessarily have a plethora of options for killing tanks, certainly in the basic common tier at least. Uh, and then Memento Mori, similar to Forever Consumed, I don't think it's a very good card, but you know, it can work if you need it. The thing is it really relies on friendly unit deaths, which you'll notice in a lot of these rings, the tanks come right in the first wave or second wave, and you really just don't have many friendly unit deaths at that point. On top of that, it costs three ember. Uh, you know, not to complain about card design or anything, but I, I kind of just don't know what the thought was with this card. Um, if anything, if it were like opposite in a way, it could, I, I feel like if it like lost damage from friendly units, it would make more sense because then it would help with the early game while then making you have to like scale and then losing its effectiveness. I don't know. It's It's kind of a weird card, but... All that being said, it can work for tank killing, especially uh, toward the middle or end of the fight. It becomes pretty powerful, and the animation is really cool. So maybe the animation alone is worth uh, playing it every now and then. Uh, Gifts for a Guard is more of a utility type card that will turn normal, otherwise not that good at killing tank cards into some pretty good tank killers. It literally adds a surge stone to everything and makes it cost zero. You know, that could even make something like a Memento Mori, you know, now it's free. Um, it automatically does at least 20 damage on top of whatever else you have. It can make it decent, but more so it's really good for like your basic cards and whatnot. You might even just, if you think about it, like if you, you could almost say like a somewhat low roll would be like drawing just three Stygian Spheres, even in that case, it's doing uh, six. What is it? Um, Seventy-eight damage. That's a pretty good amount of damage to the uh, front line. That'll bring a uh, most tanks in kill range at least. And then the snare is also another kind of utility card that is like surprisingly a pretty good card. It's it's one of those cards that just has a low investment for putting in your deck. Like it requires no upgrades costs nothing to play it's draw neutral essentially like since it draws another card the next turn and the effect of rooting an enemy can go a long way like you could use it to like stop a uh the tank distribution might be kind of heavy on a floor and you could uh just use it to uh throw that off a bit or you could just use it to keep a tank on the floor that you're on and allow yourself a little more time to chip away damage at it and scale up a bit and then do the actual kill the next turn. Uh, and Snare will do a pretty good job at actually helping you kill tanks. Um, and then I've got a few units listed here that are particularly great at killing tanks. So like Nameless Siren just scales so quickly with the Rage 2 per encant. Uh, and yeah it'll pretty much cut through tanks like butter um as long as you can get some quick incants going which you usually can if you're stygian um endless of will does really well with any sort of, of damage scaling you know as i said with how uh you know furnace tap and one over time kind of put your scaling on steroids well animus of will already has the scaling on steroids all you need is things like razor sharp edge and void binding which aren't too hard to find get a few of them or put one on holdover just keep slapping that on your animus of will each turn in no time she'll be cutting through tanks and the great thing about her is with all that multi-strike she can actually clear a whole floor of tanks just by herself uh big sludge also the you know both kind of the common thing of these three banner units right here the siren the animus of will and the big sludge is that they scale just so quickly which allows you to scale quick enough to just cut through these tanks like butter um big sledge it doesn't take much especially if you have like friendly unit harvest things like like tomb units especially the tomb unit that uh like remnant host even better than entombed explosive like that'll just uh give you a ton of damage it's not uncommon by the time you even hit like your first or, or second wave or so to have you doing like 100 damage with big sledge and that's gonna go a pretty good way to uh, killing tanks pretty consistently. Throw some multi-strike on it for even more added benefit. And Overgorger is a little bit different a story. Overgorger really uh, depends on you having the luxury to have picked it sort of earlier in the run um, and fed it 
because obviously it sucks at the start, but if you have a fed overgorger, you uh, by this mid game point, especially toward the maybe ring five and uh, six, you can be doing 100 damage multi strike just simply putting them down. Uh, and you don't even really need to scale him much more past that. Uh, he's just going to eat each tank with each strike. Um, you know, throw a furnace tap on for extra multi strike. Not going to have much problem with multi uh, with overgorger. Get him some defense with void binding or life steal or something. Uh, he'll be definitely a great tank killer. Same with bounty stalker. Uh, same story. Kind of just requires the setup of um, fights before kind of being greedy and stacking as many permanent damage increases as you can and bounty stalker definitely has no problem killing tanks another great thing about bounty stalker is like he's kind of this unit that doesn't necessarily have to be a part of your main floor um you can kind of stick him on the first or second floor here and there he has the stealth so he's not going to die and he'll always hit that front so he's always the moment you drop him in going to be guaranteed to hit that front line tank and usually as long as you, you've extinguished him a few times in previous fights, he'll get up to 100 damage, no problem, and he'll be melting through those uh, tanks like butter. I'm not sure if not sure if I've mentioned that before. The uh, how you can melt through tanks like butter, but yeah. Uh, and Siren of the Sea is more like just damage-wise a little bit less scaling than Nam Nameless Siren, but still good enough that i'd say she's worth mentioning um if you have any consistent incant she gonna melt through them like butter okay i'm stopping i i, I promise that's the last time i'm gonna say that uh so void binding this card is really good uh it is both a defensive and offensive card you know if you have any sort of consistent ember drain setup uh this is going to be your main source of damage scaling uh, along with furnace tap if you have furnace tap and then perils will be kind of adding damage here and there but really void binding you know it gives you 12 damage when you play it if you double stack it it's 24 damage you know that is one advantage void binding has over the likes of say like razor sharp edge razor sharp edge you can't double stack it to make it like super high impact when you play it but that's no real knock against razor sharp razor sharp still an amazing card uh it just means void is like very amazing in its own right as well uh so yeah you know double stack it or alternatively ember cost reduce it to zero and put it on holdover either of those are going to allow you to scale super fast and uh cut through tanks like yeah yeah i'm not going to say it but uh, uh razor sharp edge a little slower scaling than void binding in a general sense um but an unupgraded void binding technically probably scales about on par with a razor sharp edge maybe even a little bit slower since rage technically you know decreases but uh either one of them is great they're my two favorite just sort of baseline uh damage scaling cards and uh razor sharp edge i don't know it's just kind of a staple of most awoken runs in my opinion and then the final uh, uh, card we got here is the Urshan Spines, which, is, and I could even list like Icy Silophyte here as well, but uh, just the main idea here is Spell Weakness. You know, Urshan Spines is really good at it because it just puts two on the whole floor for no cost at all. That'll make it so even if you got like an unupgraded Helical Crystallis, it's now doing 150 damage. Um, or sorry, yeah, like because it does 50 damage times that by three it's 150 like come on that's a lot of damage and if any like say inch of synergy plus urchin spine that'll clear the whole damn floor out no questions asked pretty damn good for killing um tanks and that's all i gotta say about that now we're going on to these uh ring five um mobs here so harpy's guard um this is now, just a quick lore thing. I don't really get to, into lore too much uh, in these videos, but I did find it was interesting, like the uh, the description here for Harpy's Guard. Uh, heavy hitting clipped warriors will protect this Harpy. This Harpy. So they're actually referring to the boss here when you actually see this text. So I thought it was interesting that basically all three of these bosses are Harpies. Yeah, I'm sure no one cares, but whatever. Uh, so uh, you got this Master of Light. 
Um, you know, there's a few enemies that deserve my my knowing of their name. This is one of them. Uh, he can be a real bitch. Uh, he sweeps for four. So, you know, on, on par with, like, the end-game sweepers, like Pyre Wings and whatnot. But then gains damage on Slay, so you don't have the luxury of really, you know, putting down some tokens or low health dudes that you might normally. Uh, you kind of got to think twice there, or else he's really going to do some, some work on you. That is, of course, assuming you're not confident that you can't kill him. But if he, if he, you know, he gets a, a pretty good amount of rage on Slay, so... Definitely be careful about giving him slays. Uh, I wouldn't give him if you can help it. Because, you know, if you just let him through, maybe hit him a few times, you don't have to kill him. He's not too bad. Like, if he's stuck at four damage, that's not a whole lot of damage to your pyre. Um, and he's not like our overcharged tank where, like, all the harvests count. So uh, he's not quite as bad as, like, an overcharged tank. But he can still be annoying if you let him get out of hand. So... Don't let him get out of hand, you know, we'll be fine. I will say of the tanks, I don't think he's actually that bad. I probably He probably doesn't deserve my knowing of his name, but I do know his name for whatever reason. Like, I don't know this guy's name. He might even be equally annoying. But anyway, uh, and then you got this guy who is clipped something. Still don't know his last name. Uh, he's just sort of similar stats, but, but a little bit harder. Just doesn't have the sweeping, though. Just remember the sweeping dude... You know, this is like a good reason to not go all in. Like, say you got Tethys, right? I am a big fan. I, I, I generally like Frostbite the best on Tethys, but for my first upgrade, I, I do like taking a point into Conduit or Sweeper. Um, just to, because it actually gives Tethys enough health to survive this four, this four um, damage sweeping attack. Then if I have any amount of healing or armor or something else, I can just get that health back. Um, it gives me that buffer room just to not die to this thing, because uh, often you do kind of need Tethys around uh, to beat a lot of these, especially these bosses. I'll get to them in a bit here. And actually, I'll just get to them now. There's not really much else to go over here. Like, this is a, I, I would say this is not a very hard uh, fight compared to the ones we're going to go over next, because, like, you know, this one, it's whatever. And then all these other ones, it's like, uh, who cares about a healer and this? This is almost easier than a lot of the Ring 4 fights. Even here, it's like this dude behind a shield is still easier than most of the Ring 4 Wave 3s, healer, even the Wave 4 here. So really, this Harpy's Guard is pretty easy, I would say. Um, now, the boss is annoying. Uh, another interesting thing here is if you'll see in future ones, like the bosses on other fights are accompanied by people. For whatever reason, this one is not accompanied. Even though, like, the wave just seems easier, like, on top of that, they're just not accompanied by another minion on the boss wave. Um, I'm going to have a special slide dedicated to Stealth Boss, but real quick, I don't have a special one dedicated to the other two, but real quick, just, like, to go over these bosses, because I did say they are kind of the ones that catch you by surprise. So Stealth, you know, you have to survive um, eight rounds, Really six, because typically if I see st the stealth boss, I'd really recommend going into the top floor, at least with your main like group. You might have some other units on the bottom just to s and soak up damage from her. But um, at any rate, it'll be six stealth, assuming you just set up to the top and you couldn't stop her any other way on the way up. That's still like six times 13 that you have to survive with your frontliner. So when you're doing this fight, you really got to be focused on preparing for the stealth boss and the same goes for each of these but really the stealth boss like if you if you prepare as if the stealth boss is your boss you should be able to survive these ones as well you know the the sweeper dude um nine is a pretty good amount of backline damage if you don't have any sort of beefy backliner or back like uh, maybe like a guardian tome or a sap tome something like that uh you're probably not really going to get many hits in with your backliners so you really have to Think about scaling your frontliner up with uh, damage, particularly. Uh, usually, if your tank, your tank probably isn't going to worry about nine damage too much, so you don't need too much defensive scaling to take on the sweeper boss. But you might need some damage to like take on the seven hundred ninety health. There's also uh, you know ten stacks of life steal you got to deal with, uh, and then also this multi strike dude. That's twenty five damage with a pretty good amount of health. In my opinion, actually, I find this to be the hardest of this ring's bosses, this multi-striker. 
just because it's it's such insane damage at that point that you have to deal with that you just might not be ready for it. Remember, like, uh, sure, it's Arcus has like d over double the health, but and the same amount of damage, but uh, you get more waves to actually prepare for Arcus, um, and also another whole round of rewards and upgrades and stuff. So. I don't know this this in the, in their own right they can all catch you off guard and get you but uh I think just especially with something like Harpy's Guard not this doesn't represent too much damage to your pyre so you could probably be fine if you can if you're if you're kind of iffy on being able to beat these bosses you might just say fuck it to killing all the units and preventing all the pyre damage and just really focus on scaling up your tank or whoever you need to scale um, in order to beat these bosses because these bosses like I said as far as the Sort of lesser bosses go. I think they're by far the hardest ones uh, Trials mark of invasion easy as it's gonna be for pretty much all these ring this whole ring is gonna have mark of invasion is easy uh, armor emblem it Could be easy. I mean, there's just Usually armor emblem. I don't I'm not listing as easy, but here I just I don't know I don't think extra armor really matters here. It's not like there's Backliner units in the boss fight. There's like a like two of these where they are hard damage backliners like really just not much punishment for armor emblem Tough now aggressive amulet and seal of aggression because of these sweepers that can make this fight tough um, You know in that case it's pretty hard unless you have a really good way to prevent the sweeper from doing his thing. Uh, it's pretty hard to keep uh, your backline alive, like even beyond something like Tethys, like even like a 10 to 20 health backliner, gonna have some issues at that point. Um, though I guess 20 is fine, you gotta think of it like, so that's either gonna be eight damage with the multi-strike, assuming no rage gain, and then 10 damage with the aggressive amulet. Um, technically 10 plus 10 is going to be 20, but if you have some way to either get right above that 20 mark or heal a bit back, uh, you'll be fine there. Uh, and I also put Heaven Seal just because these are some annoying guys to like, like, I, I feel like anytime you see Clipped Spear Dude, Heaven Seal is going to be rough because if you can't kill him, which is pretty common with Heaven Seal, He's going to come into the pyre with 6 damage and 105 health. Your pyre's, I don't know, your pyre might be doing, I don't know, 30, 40 damage at this point, I forget. But that's a lot of pyre damage you're going to be taking with Heaven's Seal. So, you know, you know, I said before, like, you might really want to focus on scaling uh, for these bosses. Well, you might not have that luxury with Heaven's Seal because, whereas before, you're probably letting them through with, like, half health, maybe less than half health. If you do that here, they just regain all their health and do a ton of damage to your pyre. So that can definitely be an issue. But that's Harpy's Guard. Now onto the next one, Hidden Assault. Uh, kind of a unique one here. Uh, you get these stealth units that you don't see too often in other places in the game, but uh, they're definitely present here. Um, I would say, you know, if you got consistent spell AoE, you're going to have no problem here. Um, also, you're highly incentivized not to set up at the bottom floor in this fight. Uh, obviously because of the stealth. Um, but there's, yeah, that's really all there is to it. If you don't have AoE or a sweeper with quick, um, you might be looking at some damn serious damage to your front layer, which sucks given what we've kind of talked about with these bosses. But it is kind of is what it is. Like um, this is uh, by this point in the game, hopefully you have AOE. If you don't, that's rough. Um, and on top of that, there are these two waves that have a uh, balanced overcharged tank here, and that can probably fuck your pyre up. It's honestly at this point in the game, like. Especially like wave two, it's pretty rare for me to be able to deal with that overcharged tank. He's probably just going to get through and do some damage. Maybe wave four, I can deal with that one. And then on the boss wave, uh, again, if you don't have AOE or spikes, this is a lot of damage in the back line. That's going to be an issue. Uh, now, as far as um, uh, trials, I only really kept Mark of Invasion as easy. I probably could have listed... Uh, spikes as well maybe i should have but anyway um tough 
both uh, a seal of aggression. You could also argue just the extra damage as well. I can only fit so many here, but uh, if you can't deal with them, that is a ton of damage coming in both to your frontliners and especially your pyre if you can't uh, if you can't stop them before the pyre. I mean, this is a, extra damage and multi strike. It, also, whenever you see overs charge tank is fucking brutal, like just fucking brutal. Um, because that dude comes in with so much armor sometimes and <laughs> he'll just ravage your pyre. I mean, I have like freaking been 100 to zeroed from these dudes before by taking this trial when I shouldn't have. Uh, armor emblem also can be rough. That's 15 extra armor. Even your upgraded uh, standard sort of plus 10 damage upgraded AoE cards are going to have, uh, not going to be able to clear out. Um, the dudes in that case and especially like the boss round that means they're just going to be back there uh ancient hate similar like you know you're relying so much on spells to kill these dudes often um that that can represent a lot of damage particular to your tank um you know a dead tank is a just a dead freaking fire with these bosses and heaven seal heaven seal by this point in the game is just even though like even though like most of these units die within a hit, you still got the overcharged tanks and just the two of these overcharged tanks alone is enough for heaven seal to be freaking busted. Cause like, yeah, maybe you can take out the armor, but often like often the case with overcharged tank is like you're taking them down to maybe f between 30 and 50 health and just sort of mitigating the damage to your pyre. But with heaven seal, it's just going to come in with 95 health. And hit you with six damage over and over and over again and two of them coming through uh is enough to represent a ton of damage to your pyre so heaven seal is still pretty stupid and that's hidden assault um yeah and then uh harvesters of death this one oh kind of annoying but uh yeah i guess we'll just go over this quickly they got these sycophant units uh that extinguish and give two permanent damage to the rest of the floor that can be annoying especially with overcharged tank who already for the level of tankiness he has you know you got to figure they're both dying probably and that's uh, extra 20 armor to overcharge tank and uh that on top of now he's doing 10 damage yeah that sucks that sucks for a wave one a what is that 115 health 10 damage tank yeah that sucks for wave one and that's assuming no trials we'll get to that in a bit uh wave two not really as bad as wave one but still sucks because there's overcharged tank wave three a little bit worse than wave two um probably on par with wave one there's more health to get through but less damage coming in Still sucks because overcharged tank. And wave four really sucks. Uh, this dude's going to give damage to overcharged tank and the shield dune front. So, yeah, Harvesters of Death fucking sucks. I hate this fight. I always breathe a sigh of non relief whenever I see this one come up. On the bright side, at least the boss has no accompanying units. Um, but trials wise uh mark of invasion is really the only easy one i wouldn't even say spikes is easy in this case because there's just so much freaking tankiness that that represents probably a lot of damage to your pyre which is already a lot of damage to your pyre seal of aggressive and uh aggression amulet they're already dealing a lot of damage to your pyre that's just like doubling it and that's no fun heaven seal as i've said you got four overcharged tanks to deal with in this fight and they're all getting fully healed each time yeah that sucks and an armor emblem like i don't know like i'm t that just it just sucks like that even makes it so a lot of times you're getting that extra nine damage on these waves that just yeah that sucks uh and that's harvesters of death it ain't balanced yeah, and neither is this one. Sycophants of Death. Though this one's, I guess, better than the last one, but it's still pretty annoying. Um, wave 1, at least, is a joke. Uh, that's like 
you could just let them come by to your pyre, worst case, and then that's only eight damage to it. Uh, or if you have any amount of AoE at all, it'll just kill it. Uh, or spikes or anything like that. So, yeah, that's not hard. This is the reason this fight... The entire reason this fight sucks really is Wave 2. Wave 3 and Wave 4 aren't great either, but Wave 2, holy shit, this wave. This wave will stick in your mind like none other. I mean, you gotta chunk through all these guys before you get to the 105 health dude, and by the time you do that, you've added... 8 fucking damage to him, so he's doing 14 fucking damage with 105 health. And uh, that's by wave 2. Yeah, that's balanced. That's that's real balanced what it does to your pyre. Now, you know, complaining aside, there are ways to deal with it. Uh, it is not out of the... Like, Vine Grasp is amazing on this wave. Even using a March of Shields offensively, aka if you didn't know, you can use March of Shields on the enemies. I would do it here. It's worth giving the dude 10 armor just to bring him forward. You bring him forward, then you don't gotta give him all the damage, hopefully. Uh, but uh, more importantly, you can actually use your tank killing like front loaded spells. That's just way too sucks so much because it's often so awkward to try to get through these dudes and then still play, like, say, Crypt Builder or something like that. Um, granted, if you have flat AoE plus that, that's a great way to deal with it. Uh, but, you know, you're not always going to have all that. And when you don't, this wave just freaking wrecks you. And then wave 3 and wave 4, just more of the same, except the nice thing here is the tanks are actually in front, so you can actually damage them first. They also have less health, so even if the damage is applied to them, uh, you know, say in a situation where they all just sort of get up to the pyre, the pyre will shoot them first before that extinguish is applied. Uh, so really, it's really just not even remotely as bad as wave 2. But it still kind of adds to the annoyingness. And then the boss wave, you know, I would say generally is harder, the hardest of the boss waves, because especially like if in the case of uh, the multi-strike dude, that brings him from 25 damage up to 35 damage um that's kind of stupid <laughs> like that's more damage than fucking seraph by the way uh yeah and it's off you know but you know hopefully hopefully you don't have to actually kill the backliner you know uh hopefully you don't have a sweeper hopefully you don't got thorns it may you know if you see this boss in your future and you know it's the offense of seraph you may be inclined, if you have like a Sharpen or something that you've usually been playing, just to not play it. Uh, then you save yourself 10 damage on the boss, right? In, in, in Even in the other cases, it's like against... Well, you don't really have a choice. <laughs> against the stealth one, you almost don't have a choice. Because once, uh, once the frontliner dies, if he's still stealth, your units are just going to attack the sycophant. Um, and then against the sweeper, I don't think it's too bad, but really against... Uh, Multi-Strike in particular, but also the Stealth boss, the Sycophant, can be an issue. Um, but really, just the Multi-Strike, I suppose. But even on top of all that, let's say you're able to not kill the Backliner, you still have an extra 60 health added to the bosses, essentially, here. You could, add, you could argue it's more than 60, because it's like often, let's say you... Uh, play a 160 damage crit builder or something to kill this guy. Well, that's like 100 damage just goes out the window. That could have just been on the boss, right? Uh, so 60 minimum health is added to the bosses in this fight compared to every other wave which didn't add any health to the bosses. So definitely either Harvesters of Death or Sycophants has my vote for the hardest uh, Ring 5 fights. Like, uh, compare them to Harpy's guard, and it's like, uh, what? <laughs> that ain't balanced, but whatever. Maybe it's not meant to be balanced. Maybe it adds a little flavor. I can get on board with that. No, I ain't gonna complain too much there. Adds flavor to just have things that you hate, like overcharged tank. I can see that. But anyway, uh, easy will just be a markup invasion. And then the same, pretty much the same story as the other ones. Like, you don't wanna really run into multi strike, especially with frickin' dude here having 14 damage now he's doing 28 damage to your pyre with a lot of health some often a lot of health uh armor emblem 
and that's just a lot of um, extra armor to deal with. Um, you know, even and even on the boss round, remember the armor also applies to the bosses. Unlike most, mo unlike most other trials that don't apply to the bosses, armor for whatever reason does as well. Um, so that's an extra at least thirty HP you got to deal with there. Um, and ancient hate also kind of like uh, any sort of like say say you're able to bind grasp this dude to the front. You still got another thing of spell shield to burn through uh, before you can apply, like say a crypt builder, and you might not have that luxury, you know. Uh, and in that case, you're just sort of hard countered by ancient hate, which is spell shield. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much the sick offense of Seraph. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that right. Um, crystal cloak, and I I said I'd have a special um, slide dedicated to crystal cloak, and I'm doing this. Uh, you know, I don't want to like humble brag or whatever. I, I did say I don't actually find this boss for me to be so much of a problem, but I think that's because uh, I have kind of developed a strategy or I guess a set of rules that generally leave me not surprised by this boss. Now, all that being said, he'll get me from time to time still, right? Or she, I think it's a she, either way. Um, and uh, especially when I was earlier, uh, you know, newer to the game, this boss just seemed broken, right? And I don't blame people for thinking that. Uh, so you really, when you see this boss on the starting screen, I wish, I, I don't know if I'm missing it, but I wish there was a way to like hover during the fight which boss you're ending up with, because sometimes you forget. Uh, and that can really bone you if, if it's this boss, right? Like. So really pay attention when you get that first screen to which boss is coming up in this ring. If it is Crystal Cloak, um, throughout the fight, you really, really, really need to figure out a game plan for preparing for her, or she can catch you off guard, you know? Uh, this is one of those fights where you could stomp almost every other fight, but if you run into her, she'll, she'll eat your floor and then kill your pyre. So I'm just listing out a bunch of ideas here for great things that can deal with her you know wildwood sap that's like pseudo adding health to your frontliner so if you're able to just keep stacking that focus on stacking it maybe you focus on stacking that versus preserving some pyre health uh better to lose a few pyre health than to just lose it all right um same with some of these other like welder helper you could extend that to like branding right um guardian stone anything that like adds armor or even like full cycle of life like full on hp uh things like void binding prismal dust um those are particularly good uh say you set up the top round uh top floor and you have like a few buffer rounds um for the boss to reach you you can spend those rounds, uh, you know, maybe you save your prisoner dust during the fight, don't play it early, and then just wait for it to cycle back in and then play it. That way you don't burn up your damage shields and then you have, you know, however much ember you can afford to spend on it is equivalent to burning up each stack of stealth, right? Uh, you can also counter her stealth with your own stealth, engulfed in smoke and a molten encasement. You know, if you can uh, stack them up, go out of your way to play them, especially toward the end of the fight. That'll go a long way to helping a uh, lodestone. If you got an incant floor, just sap the crap out of her. She'll just sit there at zero attack, just losing stealth. By the time she actually uh, gets her attack back, you know, you might she might just be out of her stealth. And at that point, she has such low health that you can kill her with any decent amount of damage scaled unit. Um, and then also, uh, there's all these tanky type units or otherwise like just really good in uh against this unit so like crucible warden is actually better than crucible collector against her because crucible collector relies on actually attacking to kind of do his thing so unless you've stacked a ton of health on crucible collector he can have a hard time against uh uh crystal cloak um you might want to really even focus on them just like slamming a bunch of uh I don't know what I was going to say. But anyway, like uh, Crucible Warden, uh, you know, feed it as much as possible. Every time you feed it, it's going to counter one of her stealth. And Crucible Warden typically doesn't have a problem with this boss. 
thorned hollow as well. You know, if you, if you have them, you probably have pretty good regen, uh, a nor, you know, you don't really even have to focus that hard. Um, cause if you have thorned hollow, I'm assuming you got good regen and I'm assuming that's just part of your normal game plan anyway. Usually if thorned hollow is part of your main game plan, this boss is just an afterthought. Uh, Titan Sentry, the, I also put Eternal Stone here that can apply to a lot of these, but, or even like Remnant Pack, just playing it on it during the fight. Uh, but Titan Sentry, probably more so than all of them, really benefits from the Eternal Stone, giving it Endless. Um, you know, you slap a 25 health upgrade on it, slap Endless on it, and that is just the gold standard for Titan Sentry. That's going to be so good for you in any run, regardless of your deck setup. In this fight in particular, you know, you can keep Titan Sentry at the bottom floor, even if it's not like part of your main floor at that point. Um, and, you know, by the time the boss fight comes around, even if you don't have him on a good amount of health, he'll maybe eat through a few stacks, maybe a couple stacks of the stealth. And then on the mid floor, you just replay him at, uh, you know, if you did get a 25 health upgrade on him, that's going to be, uh, you know, 60 health that's going to eat up almost all the rest of the stacks and while also just applying a ton of frostbite. And then, uh, you know, after the middle floor is done, if you have space in the top, you can replay them. If not, you just probably have whatever your main floor of damage dealers is already set up. And by that point, most of her stealth, if not all is gone. She has frostbite applied also has health already lost and you're probably going to be fine. Uh, and then like sign of the sea and guardian of the unnamed, you know, just, Focus on incanting a crap ton, probably on the top floor, and they're just going to have so much health that doesn't really matter the uh, unchecked attacks that come in. Similar story with Wickless, just harvest instead of incant. Uh, hopefully, you have maybe a remnant host on holdover, or something great like that. In that case, it's probably going to be a pretty trivial fight. Lady of the Reformed is a great tank and also can just extend the burnout of the units behind her. Typically, I think in like a firelight, a uh, little fade setup, you'd, you'd see this. But even if not, she's just a good tank in general, and she'll soak up a ton of, um, you know, 40 health with no upgrades is pretty good for a two pip unit. And if you add on some upgrades or even like an endless, like she's another uh, fine endless uh, candidate, or just, you know, it's not uncommon for. Uh, Melting Remnant to have reform cards, so like Wicked Blaze and Molded. Um, you know, playing one of them will just bring her back at least with Burnout 4, assuming that's like the only time you reformed her, but Burnout almost doesn't matter because every time she gets hit, the Burnout comes back anyway. Uh, so, you know, you can get, you can burn out a ton of stacks with that. And uh, Resin Removal also is just a hilarious hard counter. You just play it on her and she loses all of her stealth. Mortal Entrapment, uh, that's going to daze her for three. Don't really like this card in general, but it is an option. Like, um, I generally don't remove it. Like, I keep it around for cases like this. Uh, I just don't really go out of my way to pick it. But, you know, if it's coming up on ring five and you don't really think you have great answers, you might just add Mortal Entrapment if you find it offered. Uh, Spike of the Stygian and Drain are also similar. They, you know, they're not dazing her, but um, they're applying Sap, which if you apply enough Sap, it essentially is functioning like a dazed. So if you can play them right before those Relentless rounds, that'll go a long way to, uh, or like, you know, right before you fight her, that'll go a long way to really help and burn through those uh, stealth stacks while taking minimal damage. And that's pretty much Crystal Cloak. Um, you know, really focus on uh, getting your frontliners ready for this fight, and it shouldn't be hard. Um, it should be pretty easy. Uh, I don't want to like trivialize the fight for people that struggle with it. Like, and I understand it's like a tough fight when you don't know what to do. But hopefully, this like this uh, sort of plethora of options give you an idea of how you can actually counter this boss. Um, and just for cards that are decent to like look out for on a run. There's other ones not listed here that would be fine too. Like anything that gives armor is going to be good. And then we get to the final ring of mid game, which is ring six. Um, not a whole lot to say here, to be honest. Uh, 
I find of the fell variants, rage is the only one that really has me think twice. Uh, the other two aren't too hard, but rage can be a bit of a problem, um, especially if you come into that fight without much pyre health. Uh, and I'll get to that in a bit here, but mainly it's a big part of that is going to be that first uh, spear dude that comes in. Uh, you know, it's behind, it has three floors of pretty much fresh alabaster guardians that you have to chunk through. And it's often pretty hard to actually kill that unit. And if you unlock, if you get unlucky and fell like applies a lot of rage to that unit, that's a lot of damage to your pyre. Um, and then Arcus, on the other hand, just, I don't know, I find Arcus to be a lot harder than fell. Um, I'm surprised people don't complain about Arcus as much to me. At, at least at the point in the game I'm at, uh, Eve, Arcus kills me more than Seraph does, honestly. Like, even Seraph the Patient. Uh, Arcus is probably... That and Talos the Pusher variant are probably the two things that get me the most. Um, if you compare Fel to Arcus, it's kind of funny. Like, Ar Arcus has 1,900 health and 25 damage, and Fel has... Uh, what 1600 health and like 10 by 20 damage or 10 by uh, 2 damage so less health less damage also i find the multi strike all it does is punish damage shield most other things uh it's like beneficial for you to for the enemy to have multi strike like sap affects it more uh thorns or spikes affect it more for, uh, if you have like frost shark it gets affected more any sort of revenge units you have get affected more um, so overall, just Arcus to me is so much harder than Fel. Uh, you just need, if I see Arcus, um, I'll probably go out of my way to even add additional like boss killing cards from my first video, uh, or try to get my tank like extra tanky, get my damage units s scaling better. Uh, you're going to need it to chunk through 1900 health and 25 damage. So that's rating six though. Not much else to say. We'll go over the specific, uh, waves here. So I find Spell Shield fell overall just the easiest, um, you know, wave wise. So the you got the Alabaster Guardians and they're gonna have five Spell Shields. So you're probably never killing them with spells. Um, so that it would be an issue if there was actually like threat coming in early. So like unlike Rage, real quick, let me just compare it to Rage this compared to this on your wave one and even like wave two right so there's just so much less threat coming in with spell shield and on top of that they're not getting rage um they're just getting armor which for these dudes it's like who cares i, I don't i usually just let these guys march on up to the pyre unless i'm able to kill them all kind of in one fell swoop uh because that's just six damage to your pyre who cares um that also makes it so they're not giving damage to the Alabaster Guardians and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, usually by the time wave two or three come up, since I'm usually sitting at the top anyway, uh, without spells, just with my normal units, I've killed the Alabaster Guardian by that point. And then I just have to deal with these threats, which really, in the grand scheme of things, aren't too much. You know, the encounters are a bit annoying. Uh, wave four is going to be the same for all all these fights, Arcus or Fell, that's annoying, having two of these dudes right next to each other. And then wave five is also annoying, you know, balance tank and all that. But then like wave six and wave seven are just like easier than wave four and wave five. So I don't, I never really understood that, but I guess at that point the, the idea is like, just, I guess, really focus on scaling your units, get ready for the boss at that point. Um, which is definitely my advice. I mean, you know, if you could t if you could handle wave four and five, you can clearly ha handle wave six and seven. And even if you couldn't, you probably still can handle wave six and seven. So just really focus on those waves, starting to uh, get ready for the boss. Um, and as far as like his her effect, uh, his or her effect is armor. I don't know. I don't find it's really that devastating. Um, it's probably the least devastating of all the effects uh so the next one we got a scourge fell um also don't really find the waves to be that tough like especially if you compare it to rage fell 
first one has no tanks. Um, as long as you have any sort of AOE, you're going to get the, through them just fine. Same with wave two. Now I will say on Scourge Fell, if you don't have good AOE, but you have like sweepers or thorn, uh, spikes type units, you're probably inclined to set up at the bottom or mid or at least middle floor here. Because on top of Scourge, one way you can get screwed in this fight is through Scourge cards. You know, you get a pretty brutal Scourge given to you from Fell, which is a two energy one. And it, I believe it's every other wave there. She's going to be putting that in. If you, if you also have unchecked dudes like that are coming, you know, they come in all waves one through four. And even on wave two, there's two of them. If you don't check them, that's gonna just ruin you. Uh, that's so many scourges that that'll make it so you can't dig through your deck because remember those count for a card draw when they put those scourges in. Uh, so you're not drawing through your deck. You're also having to waste ember. You're, you're having, or at least having to make the decision of wasting ember on consuming them or purging them, I should say, those scourge cards versus like playing your actual cards. And if you do choose to just play the cards, those are now in your deck. They'll eventually cycle back in and, and just really hurt your draw. So that is one way to definitely lose this fight. So I would, I would even without a sweeper, I might just set up at the bottom or middle just to eventually kill that Alabaster Guardian. Because this Alabaster Guardian is pretty easy to kill. Has no spell shield. Has no real anything. Uh, any amount of spell or unit damage is going to chunk through them. And then you can just have your normal units taking out these dudes. Um, Absolver, I think they're called. Wave four, I guess I lied. So before there was just the two, um, but in this one they actually have an Absolver sort of tacked on. Uh, then wave five, you know, similar, but maybe yeah, at least as bad, maybe maybe worse here, but uh, I don't know, Overcharged Tank is kind of a pain, so I, I don't think it's necessarily worse. Pretty on par, I would say, wave five. Uh, and then wave six and seven, probably a little bit tougher here because like this this overcharged tank really alone like doesn't mean anything the alabaster guardian is probably dead by then if you're dumb enough to like let your own unit die to him i guess he'll harvest but otherwise he's probably just not harvesting so i would say wave six and seven probably a little bit harder for scourge fell uh and that's scourge fell really just you know take care of these absolvers and uh, you should be fine, and if you don't take care of him, you're probably not going to be fine. You're probably going to lose. So Scourge Fell can get you, mainly if you can't get to these guys. Then Rage Fell. Like I said, I think this is the hardest. Um, you know, the, the effect of adding Rage, uh, it's not like a light amount of Rage that they add, right? Like every stack is a significant amount of damage to the point where you can even have like these sweeper units doing like 18 damage, 18 to 20 damage to you. That's pretty brutal. Um, if not the sweeper, even just these tanky units will be doing a lot. And, and another thing you'll notice here, compared to the other two, at least wave one, you got no tanks. Um, in this one, you got two waves of no tanks. But with Rage Fill, you get a tank right off the bat, even with another like damage unit behind. Um, that represents a lot of damage to your pyre. It represents a lot of damage to your actual units. On top of that, the Alice Bastard Guardian has a multi-strike, and if their rage is kind of unluckily getting stacked there, it can represent additional damage to your units. Rage can just be a tough frickin' version of Fell to deal with. In, in Wave 2, you got an Encanter tank with extra damage behind, so it's like there's no, often no clean way to deal with that. And then as I said, if you get unlucky with the rage, there's it doesn't matter how many HP or armor cards you have, like you probably just can't deal with this sweeper in a lot of cases. That can be brutal. Double tank here, if you can't chunk through them and they get a bunch of rage, that's brutal. Same with wave five. Like there's never an easy wave with rage fell. I mean wave seven, I guess, but I don't know. I feel like the fact that they can gain rage still makes them a threat, kind of, but most likely wave six and wave seven, you're probably going to be fine, just like the other ones. Uh, still probably just focus on getting ready for fell at that point. But man, oh man, I, I find, honestly, wave one is the biggest thing I got to prepare for. Like, if I can, uh, if I can uh, somehow, like, if I can combo, like, a vine grasp or a march of shields along with a big front damage spell that goes a long way, or like an inferno goes a long way 
basically you gotta find you either gotta scale fast enough at like the top floor that you can kill the guardian through it you know you, you come in dazed what and whatnot so you're only gonna get one round plus the round that they meet you to like get through that guardian if you can do that in time to beat them that's good otherwise if you can combo like a, a vine grasp or a march of shields the same turn as some sort of front line of damage that could work uh, or if you can just use front loaded damage to try to kill out the alabaster guardian on the top floor before these dudes get there that could work too those are all options um hopefully you find those options if not you're looking at some serious pain especially if the rays got stacked on them each turn and that's rage fell pretty much fuck rage fell and then arcus pretty much fuck all of arcus but i will say out of the arcus uh you know much like the scourge waves uh, so so you know all of these waves will match up to one of those fell waves that we just saw but i find this is the easiest of arcus uh for two reasons really um first reason is they don't it's the only one that doesn't have the incant uh shard which i find the incant shard is by far the most annoying one to deal with uh, it really kind of limits what you can do on your main floor or just any floor really um you know say say it's down there on this wave and you want to play like aoe well now you gotta like think like which cards am i now gonna basically make unplayable in order to kill them or do i just let them through and let two scourges shuffle in you have to make like if if the incant actually existed you'd make uh decisions like that but since it doesn't exist you don't have to deal with any of that shit on this one which is great so really you just have to deal with the dazed the weight of contrition i would say the weight of contrition almost is hardly ever an issue for me um sometimes like maybe one out of a hundred times it can be an issue uh the dazed one can be sometimes annoying but even then I, I don't know like i don't find myself often playing units enough for this to really matter it also does not apply to like morsels and stuff so i don't know really only it would matter with like tomb units uh but in that case, just don't play it. It's not like the end of the world. And then there's no Alabaster Guardians for Arcus. So when you got like waves like this, they're so easy to deal with, you know? You can just, you might just put your units at the bottom in this fight uh, because you don't even need a sweeper and you'll just clean them up. And then you don't have to worry about the scourges. Really, the only problem with this fight is if you get too many scourges shuffling in. But I just don't see how that's going to be an issue here. And then since Arcus has that extra, you know, comparing the health and damage here just has significantly more. You just want to focus on scaling as much as you can and get ready for that Arcus fight. Uh, but other than that, it's the same setup as Scourge fell. You just don't have to deal with uh, Alabaster Guardian, so it really shouldn't be much of an issue. You also don't have the two Ember Scourges being shuffled in. Uh, and then Sin of Darkness, now we kind of get to some of the Arcuses that were really a pain in my opinion. Like, uh, still at least not as bad as the next one, but, you know, you do deal with both, th both the shards that typically can cause issues are present in this one. So the Incant one, which to me is by far the worst shard, or the, you know, the worst for you, I should say. And then the dazed one is the only other one that ever seems to be somewhat relevant. Like it can get you sometimes, but really just the incant one is the annoying one. So now you, uh, you're going to have problems, especially actually in this fight come wave four and five, in my opinion. Uh, if you happen to have like the cards you need to kill these things, you know, these big tanks, but the incant shard is on that floor in that same turn, well, that sucks. Now you got decisions to make, and there's always going to be a downside. Uh, and I can't, t I, I unfortunately really can't tell you um, a good, like, you know, sometimes I can give general advice. I can't give you general advice there. It really, really depends on what your situation is. Like, if there's cards you can't afford to increase the Ember on, then you basically just can't deal with those tanks that turn and hope you can deal with them later. Otherwise, there sometimes it might be worth it just to say, hey, I'm basically turning 
you know, so many of these cards in my deck into blight cards just to kill these units this turn or to apply scaling, like critical scaling to my cards this turn. There's so many different situations that can come up there that I just can't give too much specific advice beyond that. But, you know, other than all that, uh, still it's the same as the uh, spell shield version of Fell as far as the waves are concerned. Uh, especially come wave six and seven, since those don't necessarily represent that much threat. Really, really think about scaling out toward the boss. And then the final one, which I think is the hardest just overall, even harder than like Rage Fell, is the Sin of Darkness. Um, I don't, well, I don't know if it's necessarily harder than Rage Fell. I'd say it's on par. It's the same exact unit setup. However, it's not nearly as bad. Uh, just because there's no alabaster guardians however there still are these incant things and because every single freaking wave represents like waves one through five all represent a pretty good amount of threat you're bound to have you know probably two of those waves where you get kind of screwed by the incant shard and that's just really annoying to deal with you know Especially when you got like sweepers that might kill your Tethys or or whatnot, um, or you got uh, just not much pyre health, and you really need to kill like these double clipped. I think they're clipped guardian. I don't know, clipped something. Uh, you know, it's a tough decision. Like like, do you blight half your deck? <laughs> you know, half the, or blight a few useful cards in your deck uh, because you don't think you can survive your pyre, um, or do you just let them? bring your pyre down to near death to try to be able to scale enough to kill Arcus. You know, these are the tough decisions you have to make. Uh, but that is pretty much Arcus sin of darkness. Um, arguably as hard as rage fell, if not worse, definitely the version of Arcus that struggles me the most. And this is uh, kind of the last thing we'll go over here. Just real quick notes on the trials. Um, Heaven Seal, in my opinion, is almost always the hardest and always the one that makes me hesitate the most to take. Uh, you know, it just it represents a lot of damage to your pyre is essentially what it comes down to. Um, there's so many tough tanks in this in these mid game rings that allowing them to just heal back to full makes it very you know unless you have sort of really fast scaling that you can kill everybody in kind of one go or if you have super powerful like buffed up like crypt builders and whatnot uh, if you don't have any of those you're gonna have a hell of a time with hidden seal um because that's just you know those full uh health tanks kind of having their way with your pyre is a losing situation most of the time and to a lesser extent but a similar vein armor emblem is kind of just the same problems that heaven seal has there are some additional problems that can pre present with like backliner units uh mainly in that like aoe now can't really clear them out that can be an issue with like scourge shufflers or just if you're not like super great with your tank health and the ability to heal it or defensively scale it that can be an issue if all the backliners are just able to hit them uh but Overall, I'd say it's easier than having the seal, just in a general sense, but still pretty annoying. I find generally giving the enemies more defense is always more devastating than giving them more offense. That being said, seal of aggression and aggressive amulet still can represent a lot of threat. Um, you know, if you don't have, uh, whereas these kind of, even if you have good AoE, having seal and armor emblem kind of just nullify them. With seal of aggression, your good AoE will usually nullify a lot of the threats that they pr present but not all of them like i said there's a lot of hard tanks especially if there's like sycophants giving them permanent damage increases giving them multi-strike on top of that or just some extra six damage is is pretty stupid amount of damage you're going to take to your pyre um and yeah so they're all four of these can be pretty tough trials and then ancient hate I used to think Ancient Hate was like generally the easiest, one of the easiest trials. I've kind of gone back on that. I still think it's almost always takeable, uh, but not always. Like there's, you know, especially like Umbra, if you're, if you have, uh, if you're relying a lot on like some upgraded Plinks or even more so like a uh, Entumbra Assault, 
if you're allowing that to kind of get your scaling for your crucibles or something like that, ancient hate can almost be untakeable. Um, it's it's almost untakeable in those cases. Uh, also, similarly, if you run like a spell weakness build, uh, ancient hate can be almost untakeable unless you run like uh, Inferno or something like that could probably be fine. Since remember, piercing goes through sp uh, spell shield. Uh, or if you know if you're you're running like horn break or subsiding blade something like that it's probably fine but uh so you know like i said it's like nine times out of ten it's fine to take but there is that one out of ten time where it will actually lose you the run i've had it happen uh a lot with ancient hate where i shouldn't have took it and i took it uh and it just lost me the run um really think like how much of your damage really not only your damage but just your your sort of boss killing game plan relies on you being able to uh slay units with spells or at least chip in some damage with spells uh if it's any significant amount you might want to think twice about ancient hate and then retribution and mark of invasion are generally just so easy uh that i almost always take them here retribution the only reason i wouldn't take retribution is if uh you know i didn't have a very high health backline unit um and i thought that maybe they'd die like maybe, maybe if you have like animus of will that does like the only health upgrade they have is like a battle stone um and they're kind of a big portion of your game plan like i could see that being a reason not to take retribution uh, things like that but mostly i would say retribution is pretty easy in a lot of cases all it really means is that the enemies do like four more damage and can hit your backliners with it <laughs> but in general it's like I would say it's like comparable to seal of aggression and aggressive amulet just easier right um and that's pretty much retribution and then mark of invasion is just so easy like i those sycophants the only time it's ever an issue uh is like that one fight where the enemy has to have a haste enchanter then it can screw you but even then it's not too bad most of the time uh generally always taking that mark of invasion it's probably i would say easier than the first one and that's pretty much going to do it for this guide uh, i do plan on now finishing the kind of uh uh why am i blinking on it i want to say like trinity what do you call like three three things in a series why am i blinking on the name yeah, whatever. We'll call it Trinity. Whatever. This Trinity of guides. Uh, I'll finish it with the end game. Uh, end game will be a pretty short video, I think, just because I've kind of covered half of the end game already in my Seraph guide. So I don't want to be too redundant there. But I do want to kind of go over, especially like the final ring. Um, I want to go over like the trials because those final that final trial is really important to know when and when not to take it. And just, you know, uh, the final ring uh, decisions, because it's always pretty consistent. You're going to get one side that has a hell vent, one side that doesn't. You're going to have a merchant of magic, merchant of steel. I want to give some ideas um, on how to navigate that, because it is pretty important. But yeah, that's pretty much going to do it for this guide. Uh, thank you, as always, for the support uh, that I see from so many people. Uh, it definitely makes me want to keep doing these. Uh, you know, just seeing uh, feedback is, is pretty awesome. Um, so, yeah, until next time, hopefully this is helpful. Mid-game guide complete.